Good morning. Uh, this morning's reading is from First Peter chapter one, uh, verses three to nine. And I'm actually not sure which page that is in the Church Bible. Sorry. All right. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Thank you. Well, this morning we're in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. And you, if you have uh, your Bibles there, you might like to tend to that passage. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 1 and the verses that Reuben read to us. And I've entitled the message this morning, uh, Gospel Mercy. Gospel Mercy. Peter's intention here in this letter is to encourage the Christian church. And his way of doing that is to re remind them and us of Gospel Mercy, of the mercies that we have in the Gospel. Peter was in Rome when he wrote this letter and he was there during the time of Emperor Nero and he was aware of the growing hostility that was coming towards Christians. And so he writes this general letter to Christians spread over a wide area of much of what is now Turkey. And many of these Christians would have perhaps felt vulnerable, exposed, isolated and alone in their faith as they anticipated the persecution that was coming, knowing that they were powerless to stop it. So in order to bring encouragement and praise to the hearts of these scattered Christians, Peter is going to remind them of the gospel mercy they have received in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, isn't this where encouragement must begin and end for each one of us? Yes, we have much to be thankful for as we sit here this morning. We're thankful for our families. We thank you for our jobs. We're thankful for our health. We're thankful for our retirement income. We're thankful for this country in which we live. And we're thankful for much more. But you see, these things can never be the grounds of our encouragement and hope. Because these things can be so easily taken from us. They can be gone in a moment. Things we've taken for granted for many years can be taken from us. And we are powerless to prevent it happening. They provide no sure and secure basis for hope and encouragement. We need something more. We need something more than those things. We need something that can never be taken from us. And Peter has that very thing here for us this morning. A gospel mercy. And it's the reason we praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wants these people to have hearts full of praise in spite of the uncertainty of life. He wants their praise to be directed to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, identity is important. You see what Peter is doing here in those few verses? He is identifying for us the God to whom our praises should be directed. Who is this God we worship? Who is this God we praise? Who is this God we love? Who is this God we hope in? Who is this God we testify of before others? How is this God to be identified? He is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he's to be identified. Identified as a distinct and living person and yet a divine being. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In what ways is God the God of Jesus? We understand that he was the father of Jesus. Jesus was his son. But in what way was God the God of Jesus? You see, that's the wording here. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he is the God of Jesus in that while Jesus was on earth, he was in his human nature dependent upon God as God for all things, including his being raised from the dead. So you remember on the cross... On the cross for Jesus it was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He addresses God as his God. And yet also on the cross Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So you see there Jesus as the eternal Son of God, as the second person of the Trinity, relating to God as God as well as Father. And in so doing... He gave us the identity of the God to whom we owe our life, our salvation, our praise, and our worship. Identity is important. Many people in distant lands bow the knee to a God called Allah. Is Allah simply another name for the God of the Bible? Well, we ask ourselves, is Allah the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? You see, identity is important. And the answer is, well, no, he is not. He's not the God of the Bible. He is not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does each one of us possess a divine spark that connects us to the divine that is in all things? Well, is that in a spark? the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, no, it's not. So we can't put our hope in that. We can't find life in that. You see, if our hope is in something other than the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, then it is a false hope. Well, the question is sometimes raised, well, what about the God of the Old Testament? He seems so different from the God of the New Testament that Jesus related to. In the Old Testament, we see this one who created all things in six days, who sovereignly, personally, and providentially controls all things, who set his love on the descendants of Abraham and brought them out of Egypt with a strong and mighty hand, who appeared before them at Sinai and made them his own people by covenant promise, who promised their King David an eternal throne, who brought wrath and curse and destruction on judgment, on those who disobeyed him and promised love and grace and, and covenant fidelity to those who belong to him. Who is this God? Who is this God? Revealed as such in the Old Testament. He is none other. He is none other than the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we cannot think of God apart from our Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever you see God on display and revealed in the Old Testament, we cannot see him there apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, the one in whom his purposes of salvation come to pass. And it is this God, and this God alone, who has come to us with a great mercy. In verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
in his great mercy. That's how Paul wants us to think of this God relating to us. He relates to us with a great mercy. And now Peter is going to give us three reasons to praise this God he's identified because this God has given us by way of gospel mercy three things. He's given us a new birth. He's given us a permanent inheritance. And he has given us a protecting power. That's his great mercy unpacked for us. That's his great mercy being unraveled here for us. We've been given a new birth, a permanent inheritance, and a protecting power. Verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. New birth into a living hope. The birth of every baby is the birth of a new hope. With the birth of every baby comes hope for that child and the new life they represent. With the living child comes a living hope. Now God has birthed us by giving us new spiritual birth, something we could never do for ourselves. His Holy Spirit has labored with us and new birth in Jesus Christ has, has been our experience and so now we have a living hope. Living because our hope is anchored to Jesus Christ. Living because he is a living Savior who has been resurrected from the dead. That future hope has been brought into our presence because it has been anchored in the past. So before going any further, we must pause here and ask whether you have experienced this new birth. In John chapter 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. That's the new birth that Peter is referring to here in verse 3. Well, Nicodemus asked... Uh, how is one to be born again? And the answer from Jesus was clear and unmistakable in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. So Peter would have us ask the question this morning. Have you believed in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Are you willing to repent of your sin and turn away from it and be forgiven for it? Have you prayed and confessed your sinfulness and asked God for his forgiveness and cleansing? And your assurance is that your prayer will be answered. You will be forgiven. You will be born again by the Spirit of Christ. You will then be like a newborn baby with a new and living hope. In fact, Peter thinks of you as a newborn baby longing for the milk of God's word. Remember when the wheels of the bus go round and round and the babies go wah, 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 and the mothers go shh, shh, shh. See, they're longing for the sincere milk that only their mothers can provide. They're newborn babies. And so Peter says in chapter 2, verse 2, like newborn babies, craves pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is God. With the new birth comes a craving for the Scriptures, a craving for the Word of God, because it's only by this Word will you grow strong in your faith and in your hope and in your praise. So people sometimes say to me, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You might have wondered that yourself. <laughs> do I have to keep going to church in order to be a Christian? Well, the answer is you have to keep going to church in order to grow as a Christian. Because there at church, and indeed in other places, you are fed with the pure milk of the Word of God, which enables your faith to grow strong. Now, you can feed it to yourself at home, certainly. But you know when you come to church, that's what you'll be fed by. And so it's a good way to evaluate 
what church you should attend. Is it a church where the milk of God's word is being fed to spiritual babes? Because that's what we long for in our new birth and in our living hope. Well, that's the first gospel mercy. For those who have been born again, there's a second gospel mercy, and that's a permanent inheritance. Verse 4. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. Every child is born into an inheritance of one kind or another. When you've got that newborn baby in your arms, you're thinking suddenly, oh my, oh my, how am I going to afford their tertiary education? <laughs> it comes with that new birth, doesn't it? What inheritance are they going to have from you? What will you be able to leave them? What will you be able to provide for them? Part of the gospel story and its new birth is the inheritance that comes to us from God our Father. Unlike an earthly inheritance, this inheritance can never perish, spoil or fade because it's not an inheritance to be found in this world. Rather, it's found in the world to come, in heaven, as it says there in verse 4 kept in heaven for you. Now these Christians that Paul was writing to were preparing themselves for the suffering and persecution that was coming. Perhaps they were thinking about what the loss of all things would mean for their children. Would they be able to leave behind for them anything if they suffered the loss of all things? And Peter wanted to reassure them and reassure their children that they have an inheritance that no emperor in Rome could take away. Theirs was an inheritance kept in heaven for them. An inheritance of eternal life, eternal joy, eternal peace, and the glory and presence of God and of Jesus Christ. My friends, God has claimed us for his own, and hence he has claimed us for his inheritance. It's an inheritance that is as permanent as God himself is permanent because it's an inheritance that comes with God's promise. So can God ever pass away? Is there anything in heaven or earth or under the earth that can cause God to disappear in a puff of smoke and never be heard from again? Is God under threat by way of his existence of anything? And the answer is no. Therefore, beloved, our inheritance is as permanent as God himself is permanent. It's a good thing to remember when the walls start to close in. We can praise him for the new birth and for the permanent inheritance. Well, our third gospel mercy is not just our new birth and inheritance that will be preserved. We also ourselves will be preserved or kept until the coming of our full salvation. Verse 5. Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Our inheritance is kept for us and we are kept for our inheritance. A new birth, a permanent inheritance and a protecting power. Our faith in Jesus Christ for our new birth connects us to God's protecting power. It's a power that ensures that nothing will separate us from the inheritance we have been born into. Nothing will prevent us coming into the fullness of that salvation which is yet to be revealed. Now notice there in verse 5 that our salvation is considered to be already ours yet there is still more to come. There's a future element to our salvation. We don't have it all now. You see there at the end of verse 5, the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, our salvation in its fullest sense includes our election, our calling, our regeneration, our faith and repentance, our adoption, our Holy Spirit baptism, our sanctification, and resurrection to glory. I'm running out of space here. It's way over here. Resurrection. We started back here with 
election before time began goes all the way to glory when time is no more. You see, and all those elements of our salvation, some are past, some are present, and some are future. And yet God's protecting power will ensure that all these elements come to pass. Not one of them will fall or fail because it's not dependent upon us as to whether or not our salvation full and free will be revealed to us at the last time. Our salvation is guaranteed in God's promise. Just as he has acted in the past and in the present to secure our salvation, so he will act in the future to secure our salvation. It's a gospel mercy. Hence our reason for praising God and rejoicing in him. A new birth, a permanent inheritance and a protecting power. Verse 6. And this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. Yes, trials and sufferings are coming. And in the midst of these, your faith will prove to be genuine. And when Jesus Christ comes in all his revealing glory, your faith that has stood the testing of trials and suffering will bring praise and glory to his name. Verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. An inexpressible and glorious joy. That's the result of these three wonderful gospel mercies. That's the result of a new birth, a permanent inheritance, and a protecting power. Inexpressible and glorious joy. We believe in and love one, the one we have not yet seen. We are like people who are walking in a dark valley. And the bush is overhead and it's dark and there's not a lot of sunlight and, and it's damp and it's dripping and our feet are tired and the pack is heavy. We're walking along through this bush and suddenly we come to a clearing and we look up and there... Right on the mountain top, the sun is shining. Down in this dark valley, it's cold and wet and dark. But up there on the mountain top, the sun is shining. And we look up at that and we say, well, that's where we're headed. That's the goal. That's where I'm going. And so suddenly you see we have a reason to be encouraged because we see the goal of where we are headed. And so... We are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy because in verse 9 we are receiving the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. God is working even now in the midst of trials and difficulties the goal he has for us, namely our salvation, full and free, that he means for us to possess and experience in full measure when Jesus Christ is revealed. So just a few words of application here as we come to an end. Inexpressible and glorious joy in the midst of sufferings and trials. Yes, the sufferings and losses are temporary, but the joy is eternal. When we see the elderly saints in our congregation, who have experienced a lifetime of trials and joys. Yet their spirits are alive and constantly renewed in the Lord. They pray and they read their Bibles and their faith is genuine and their joy is heartfelt. And we talk with them, we fellowship with them and we see them week by week and we are encouraged. And we are blessed because there we are seeing a living demonstration that in spite of the trials and the sufferings of their life, by way of a new birth and a permanent inheritance and a protecting power, they have inexpressible and glorious joy. How bereft we would be not to have these precious ones in our midst. 
I remember a time when Catherine Young was here reporting on her time in Ye in South Sudan, where she continues to serve. She talked about being in a Sudanese worship service and seeing the people there praising and worshipping God. Do you remember that? Remember her talking about that? She experienced firsthand their inexpressible and glorious joy, knowing something of how they had suffered. They had endured material suffering as they had lost so much. They had endured physical suffering at the hands of wicked men. They had endured heart suffering as they bore the loss of children and loved ones to war and to distress. And yet here they were, greatly rejoicing with inexpressible and glorious joy. And Catherine looked around in amazement. How do you explain that? How do you explain that? Well, no earthly or human explanation will do. Won't even come close. A supernatural miracle had been worked on the inside of those hearts. A new birth, a permanent inheritance, a protecting power, gospel mercy poured into their lives. And here they were dancing and singing and praising God and they had lost virtually everything that this world could offer. It's a miracle of God's power. And it all begins for each of us. We too can be where they are. Begins for each of us with a repentant faith commitment to Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. So what has been your experience of Christ's gospel mercy? Is it time for you to bow the knee afresh and confess your sins to him and claim again for yourself that living hope, that gospel mercy in all its glorious fullness? Let's just take a few minutes now in, in silent uh, uh, prayer while we once again talk to the Lord about his gospel mercy for our own hearts. Father God, as we look back over our Christian life, we can see so much reason to praise you, the way you've blessed us and encouraged us. Yet, Father, we long for more. We do not know what the future holds in this life. So we long for more of the experience of those gospel mercies for us that our hearts would be greatly encouraged and be able to encourage the hearts of others. Father, we pray that you would give us a perspective to those mountaintops where the sun is shining, where you are preserving and holding out for us the goal of our salvation. We long for that day of the revealing and appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask, Father, that as we stand on the rock of your gospel promise, that your mercies would flatter our heart afresh as we confess our sins, as we confess our need for your forgiveness, that our hearts might be full of praise and worship to God of great mercy. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.